We're almost there, folks. <laughs> it's uh, only me standing between you and a good dinner and a few drinks. But it's been an incredible conference, hasn't it? Look, I've attended a number of these LiveX conferences, and honestly, I just think this has been the best yet. Great formats, inspiring speakers, you know, thought-provoking discussions, both here in this room in the formal discussions, in, it, in its moco in the informal discussions that we have. This last session, you know, is all about wrapping it up. Um, talking about what we've learnt over the last two days and how we apply that going forward. I guess we've all learned a lot. I've certainly learned a lot from the last two days. We've, we've, we've learned a little more about the challenges facing the industry. But, you know, we already know a lot about the challenges facing the industry. What's more important is that we've learned about some of the solutions. I mean, that's the critically important thing to come out of conferences like this, to learn about some of the solutions and then go away and apply them. I mean, a few things have resonated with me. You know, we've got to be open. How many people have mentioned that over the last two days? We've got to be open. We've got to innovate. We've got to constantly innovate. You know, we've got to get rid of the dumb things in our lives, and we all have dumb things in our lives. I've got plenty of them in my life. We've got to invest in relationships. You know, that's incredibly important. And it's not only got to be investment in relationships with people we're comfortable with. You know, but it's, a, it's got to be investing with people that we're a bit hesitant about. You know, the regulator. <laughs> or, or, or animal welfare groups. You know, we've got to invest in knowledge. We've got to know about trends. That was what David Hughes uh, uh, emphasised. And the minister... You know, she really delivered a strong message, I thought. A strong message about communicating. Communicating with urban Australia. Communicating with Oxford Street and Collins Street. I mean, that's just going to be so vital for our industry going forward. And I guess the other thing that resonated with me, and that resonated quite significantly with me, is that we've got to be confident. You know, we've got to get rid of the siege mentality. And all of us, I think, working in this industry, if we're honest, there are times that we have a little bit of the siege mentality. And we've got to scrub that from our, our minds and be positive and confident going forward. So this session is all about um, querying some key people in the industry. You've got the, the, the conference organisers have put together a wonderful panel of industry leaders, industry leaders in industry service companies, industry leaders in, in, in ALIC, exporters and producers. And it's all about querying them about what they've gained from this conference over the last couple of days and, 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 and how they will apply that going forward. You know, you know, the key thing that you've got to ask after you go away uh, uh, from each of these sessions, after you invest two days of your life in something like this, is how are things going to be different going forward? So that's what we're going to concentrate on in this, in this last session. I mean, we'll open it up uh, to you guys in a moment, but as facilitator... Uh, I get the privilege of asking some of the first uh, questions. And I, and I thought I'd start with you, Mark. Um, you, you've obviously got a key role in the industry as, as CEO of ALEC. I think you've been there 12 or 18 months now, so you've had, to, had your feet... Nine months. Nine months, OK. <laughs> he's, he's a fresh face. He'll have fresh ideas. 
Um, look, you know, can you give me a broad view from your perspective about where you see the industry going forward? What are the priorities? What things you need to change as an organisation in the industry itself? Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, perhaps it feels like 18 months. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, I think uh, just to reflect some of the comments that you mentioned then, I completely agree with moving away from the siege mentality. I think the industry is in a really positive place at the moment. And the key word you said there is confidence. We have the right to be confident now. Um, and I think that's critically important. In terms of uh, the key things that we need to progress over the next two years, I'll probably say four things. The, the first is the amalgamation question. Um, and, and we need to make sure that it's not a question of uh, cost savings or efficiency. That, that discussion is actually about building industry capability um, that reflects and integrates our political and evidence-based arms. And that's going to be really critical for the, the industry to move forward. The second point, and this is probably quite high level, but I think we need to adopt a culture and an attitude that we are part of the broader red meat industry. Uh, Jason Strong's presentation went to the fact that we're the fourth lar largest market, fourth largest red meat market. We need to be treated like a market, we're not an exception. We are part of the red meat industry. And that goes to our long-term capability. Um, and that leads to my third uh, goal, I think it's that sustainability of our markets, renewing our relationships with our uh, most um, reliable and uh, most enduring trading partners, looking to new markets, um, those sort of things. I think that's critically important. And then I think we also need to start moving into a regulatory space that rewards good performance. And um, there's an incumbency on industry to demonstrate that good performance, but um, a regulatory environment that facilitates it in a very strong way would be uh, a good way of getting there. And, and Mark, I'd just like to quiz you. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of... I, I've been close to ALIC, I guess, over the last couple of years, but I'm also an outsider. Um, but, you know, from an outsider's point of view, I just see a very significant transformation in ALIC over the last couple of years. I mean... You know, we talked a little bit earlier on about this code of conduct committee that's the three-month moratorium that the, the, the exporters led. It's, it's some of the changes in ASIL standards that are cost the exporters' money, but they, they believed in them because they were going to improve welfare. I mean, do you th somebody earlier on today talked about the responsiveness of an industry being important. Do you think that responsiveness is being recognised and do you think you're getting traction with some of these changes that are being made? To the first uh, point of your question, Peter, I, I think it's important to remember that it's exporters themselves that actually demonstrate that leadership, uh, those changes. Um, sometimes they're uh, issues that are subject to internal debate within industry and the, the, the industry needs to work through it. But every time those changes have been made, there's a genuine commitment from exporters to get there. And I think that's really important to remember. Um, to the other aspect around the perception within the community, I do think we need to tell our story better. But there's a key factor in that, and it's the space, having the space to do it. And the other factor is actually understanding what the community thinks. So I think the presentation from Kieran Moffat today was uh, very indicative because I've always had a view that we've been guilty of making assumption about what the community thinks of us. Um, certainly, and I'm not meaning to uh, uh, go back in history, but this, this assumption that we always need to mitigate outrage. And I always thought, how do we know how to communicate with the community if, when they're outraged if we don't know how to communicate with them when they're not? And that's what we need to do over the next few years, is actually understand what their concerns are, build strategies off those concerns, and communicate with them in a meaningful way. That's when we'll gain traction. Uh, I certainly thought that was one of the major um, messages that have come out uh, out of the last couple of days, that yeah, you're much better communicating your message when there's not the noise of an issue around. And, and unfortunately, I think we're much more used to sort of uh, communicating when there's an issue uh, flying. Je Jeff, perhaps if I could turn to you. Um, um, I mean, 
you know, clearly, um, it's been mentioned many times over the last couple of days, is this mutual dependency between producers and live exporters. Uh, there's sort of an absolute dependency there or very heavy dependency on each other. Um, I mean, ha what do the uh, producers, would, would the producers like to see in terms of changes over the last, uh, over the next couple of years? Yeah, um, good question. They're, I mean, look, we're all, we're all in it together and we're all selling the one product. And, um, you know, we're seeing pressures back from, from the market at the moment whereby, you know, there's two things we, we're, not, we're not controlling at the moment or we can't control is, is regulation and price going into, into these markets. One thing is that we're not going to drop is our, is our farm gate price, but regulation we can manage. But it's also building that culture and, and staying ahead of the market um, with the product we're selling because, you know, if we're not selling it in a, in a glossy box and a bit of plastic, we're selling it in a nice fresh hide that's recyclable. Um, and that, that's, that's what we've got to understand is the producers are producing a product that's going as a live article into a niche market. And I think Australia's in the position where we are producing one of the, one of the best products, but we've got, to, we've got to be compensated for that. We've got pressures from, from all over the world. We've, we've achieved a, a farm gate price and export price into, into most countries that we're getting, we're getting pushback. It's expensive and we're, getting, we're setting the benchmark for you know, a powerhouse like... South America, Brazil, Argentina, to, to you know, and Indian, Indian buffalo to supply into our market. So we we've got to keep those cultures going, keep that sale product going into the into markets to be able to, 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 to achieve that niche and achieve that price. So, so obviously producers can t play a major part in in getting the product right. You know, in in that on farm preparation and the treatments and the, and the disclosure and all of that area. I mean, is are there Areas more broadly that you think producers can contribute to in, in these issues that the live export industry is facing? Yeah, look, it's um, yeah, definitely there's definitely opportunity there um, to, 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 to keep the voice out there, to keep the, the knowledge of, of the industry and, and also keep, keep the backing. I mean, you, you look at the, the situations as a producer and, and you know, we're out there producing the better product and, we're, we're, and we're, you know, we're manufacturing it to a certain level, but... Somewhere along the line, we're getting egg on our face in regards to footage that's coming out of ill treatment. I mean, animal welfare was discussed every second conversation all the way through the conference of the last two, two, two days. So we, we, as, a, we as producers, have got to, we've got to protect that. And, and maybe it's in, we're in a situation where we in this room, you know, are all running a business and we have animal welfare at our best interest. Mm. But what's bringing us unstuck is the next level. It's, it's, it's the people that are working in the industries that they are frustrated, but they've got to understand that they've, they've been watched. And maybe there's an education process or maybe there's a monitoring process that we need to be able to make sure that these outcomes, this footage, this stuff that's going out, that's, that's, that's potentially bringing our, our industry back to where, we, where it shouldn't be, um, needs, to be, needs to be addressed. So, you know, producers probably need to be aware that this is, this is going on and some sort of a system needs to be put in place to, to mitigate it. Thanks, thanks, uh, Jeff. That was <laughs> very good. Uh, John, uh, I mean, perhaps I can sort of just get your perspective on, on communication. I mean, John has been mentioned uh, a number of times in the last couple of days because he's very heavily involved with the Sheep Collective and the Cattle Collective. Um, uh, I, I mean, again, one of the really strong messages had the last couple of days has been uh, the importance of trust and community perceptions. And I mean, I think we were told in a previous session today that uh, community perceptions are shaping industries more than ever before. Um, I mean, I'm, ju I'm just interested, I guess, I mean, one of the other things that, said to, uh, that was said this morning by Jason, that we allow young people into, the, uh, into industries and then say, you know, you can't change anything. But I don't know whether it's been determination, John, but you and some of the other young people in the industry have, have changed a lot. Um, I'm just wondering what sort of drove you in some of these initiatives that you've been so involved with, such as the Cattle Collective and the Sheep Collective. 
and where you see them going, how you see them evolving over the next couple of years. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's, it's been really uh, inspiring to actually uh, watch our in-market staff. That's where it really started for me. Um, I mean, we've got one of our in-market staff here today and seeing pictures of him and watching him go out to the back villages in Indonesia and training people about animal welfare and he's changing the culture as a reflection of this industry. It, it, it's just inspiring. So when the opportunity came up and Holly came to me and it was a shared leadership values that, I mean, we have Bindi and Renee and Holly and Nick and Andy of the original Sheep Collective team. It was something that I just wanted to be part of and then seeing from my perspective in the cattle industry, wanting to roll it out to the cattle side because there's so many unique characters in this industry that we just have to take the opportunity to tell their stories. But at the same time, I think as an industry, we've got to become mature enough to understand that we need to learn how to better communicate. Now, I know that's been said over and over again, but it's also understanding that even though not everyone for, on social media, for example, is active and engaging, people are watching. So if you go on and say, you vegan whatever, and throw slurs out, people are looking at the industry negatively, even if someone's trying to support it. So we've got to learn how to have these respectful conversations. So if someone's attacking us, we can say, well, here's the information, not shoving it down their throat, and make up your own mind. And I think if people see us acting as a mature industry, they'll take a lot more respect. And I think Kieran's, I was really interested in Kieran's uh, presentation today to see how industry is actually perceived. Um, I, I really want to find the areas that people want to know more about and then try to communicate better along those lines. Because I don't know whether you picked this up, but one of the things that uh, I've taken away from this conference is that, you know, just so often we respond with a technical uh, answer on, along a technical dimension. And, and really what's come across more clearly than ever in, in this conference is the main things that you've got to show and that we've got to communicate is that we care. I mean, I think that's incredibly important, that, 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 that we care uh, and that we have an interest in these issues and are responsive um, and, and are listening to what people are saying and are responding to it. You know, it's just not a technical... I think too often we just respond in a technical mentioned. you agree? Oh, totally. I, I think um, it's taking... We've got to look out of more than just talking to industry and using in industry language. We've got to put it in language that uh, the wider community can understand and absorb, and that's not trying to treat them like idiots. It's, it's, it's just making it... Because if someone told it to me about the technicalities of mining... Yeah. I, I wouldn't know it. So to be able to absorb it, you need to have it in a, a more, much more uh, palatable uh, manner. Yeah. And look, finally, Sam, uh, if I could just uh, get get your perspective on what's needed going forward. I mean, you're the over the industry service provider. You know, uh, I mean, in the R and D dimension, for instance, you know, what are the two or three key priorities over the next year or so? Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, look, uh, there, there's there's a couple of levels to that uh, question, Peter. There's firstly, there's the, the research priorities we're working on, but what are we working on in extension at the moment, and what what's outbound? So, the, the things we're working on at the moment are, are covered in the areas of environmental management. We're looking at bedding, ammonia, and and um, stocking densities, as well as animal welfare indicators, which has already been discussed a couple of t times during out the forum. At, uh, you know, LiveX Collect uh, is, a, is another bit of technology that we're working on um, to try and improve efficiencies. 
Um, and look, there's some more technologies that are lower level, things like automated counting, but you know, if we flip that over and say, well, what's, what are we working on outbound things now? We've been investing an enormous amount of work over the last 18 uh, to 20 months where we're really drawing and delving deeply into the research we've been doing over you know, a best part of a decade in heat stress, um, the, the, the contributions we've been making to ACEL um, in the, the various reviews, we've drawn down on all the research we've we've been producing there. So the the uh, and that and that's how our industry works. We 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 really have to work hard in those um, areas of stocking density and and particularly that I mentioned the heat stress. Um, the the the, the, the sub submissions we've been providing have all been drawing into the the enormous range of research we've done over you know almost two decades now. So I th I think the Three key priorities are animal welfare, animal welfare, animal welfare. And, you know, I think this industry invests more in that area than uh, virtually anybody uh, in Australia and perhaps even the world. I mean, it's really a key item for this industry and it's something that we can, that we can lose sight of. But look, yeah, yeah, I probably uh, hold the questions long enough. Um, you know, I'd, I'd just like to uh, open it up uh, to discussion from the floor and ask uh, whether there's anybody that uh, wants to quiz the panellists like I wanted to quiz the panellists. A question over here, Stephen. Yeah, just a quick one as a sheep person in cattle country. Um, understandably, um, individuals may question at times why we support each other's industries, considering the, the harrowing things we go to. Can you maybe just run through the, the um, a bit of the reasoning as why we are all in this together? It is sheep and cattle, and why, why, um, why we've received such strong support from SFOs around the country and each other's industries. So, uh, so I might. Uh ask Mark to respond first, but then I'll ask you, Jeff, as a cattle producer, why you should be supporting the sheep industry. So, Mark? Welcome North Crispy. You're a long way from home. Hope you're handling the heat. Um, look, I, I think uh, there's a thin edge of the wedge in agriculture. Um, and I think many times that's a cross that the live X sector has had to bear. And so there's that philosophical perspective in that um, when agriculture is being attacked, we do need to consolidate, we do need to come together. And I think that's symptomatic of uh, that support that comes across. But I also think that it's uh, very reflective of the, the importance of the trade. I mean, the, at, at a broad level, you can assume about 10% um, of both the sheep and cattle industries are live X related. Um, there was a report from Mercado on the cattle industry that about 50% of the uh, of the profits are returned to farm. Um, but the most important thing that the live export industry does is it underpins price because it uh, creates market diversification for producers. So um, certainly uh, last year when a lot of questions were being asked about the live sheep trade and um, obviously questions about its future. It, it was heartening that there was that uh, collegiate approach because one way or another, the whole national industry will be impacted. So I, I think there's a couple of angles of why it's important, but um, I, I do think there's a broader principle about the importance of agriculture tied in with all of that. Jeff, do you want to have a bite at that one? Oh, look, I'd like to keep it quite simple. I mean, we're all in it together. I mean, it's a red meat. It's, it's a protein. It's a niche pro product that we're, we're supplying out of Australia. So, um, you know, I don't think one can be isolated to the other, especially out of the West where we, we're doing a lot of you know, co-mingling of um, livestock coming out of, um, which is you know, sharing load and sharing expenses and costs of, of, of shifting livestock, which, whether, whether it be sheep or cattle. So um, I think, it, you know, as, as producers of Australia, we need to be pushing both. So... Um, you know, we both have the same problems with sheep and cattle, and um, if, 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 if we do have problems, I, I think we're getting over it quite easily now. So, um, yeah, I just think it's yeah, one of those things that we just need to get Peter, together. Peter, can, Peter. Think, can I just oh, add yeah, to sure. this? Um, I think it's really important from a reputational standpoint that 
if we start shutting down industries and threatening food security to countries, uh, even though it may be for sheep, I mean, people like Indonesia go, oh, is this going to happen again? At what point? And it forces them. It's only since 2011 that they've gone out, and uh, Indonesia's gone out and started looking for boxed beef and looking to bring in from Brazil. So I think from a reputational standpoint, uh, the cattle people need to back the sheep people because if we start shutting down in the Middle East, well, we, we send cattle to the Middle East, are they going to shut that down as well? And then it's all the box beef and the, the box meat and the grain and the dairy products. So I think that's why we're in it together. We're a complementary system. Steve. Thanks, Peter and, and team. I'll just go back to your point, Peter, about um, that we get a bit technical when we're trying to explain things, and I think that's very much the history of the trade. And listening to Greg Pankhurst up there before talking about how the industry directly employs 250 animal welfare officers in Indonesia or something like that. I just wonder how you guys feel about when you get the, uh, the, the, the question at a dinner party that stops all conversation when someone asks you what you do. <laughs> Instead of saying that you're a livestock exporter, you say, um, I employ, I'm part of an industry that employs 250 welfare officers animal welfare officers in Indonesia, or um, I'm part of an industry that supports 10,000 smallholder farmers in Indonesia that supply, um, supply produce to, um, to animals in feedlots, or something like that. And just one other, so that's a question. Secondly, um, your issue, Peter, when you said, um, you know, our three biggest issues are animal welfare, animal welfare, animal welfare, I think you might have the first two right, but the third one, <laughs> I think we should all be mindful that we need to we we need industry and exporter welfare because yeah. the, the industry yeah. we've got a siege mentality but we have been under threat for a long yeah. time and it is having a toll on lots of businesses yeah. and we need to be sustainable from an animal welfare point, point of view but we also need to be sustainable from an economical point of view otherwise it all fails. But you're an animal too, Stephen. So you come under the third. <laughs> Maybe later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, who wants to tackle uh, that point? Mark? Uh... I'll have a go, Steve. Um, so I live in Canberra. It's a fairly left-leaning population. And a few I'm not... animals there too. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's a very left-leaning electorate um, or population, and that's not to say that uh, I know that's applying a bit of a stereotype, but when I first took on this job, I'll admit, um, you know, friend, groups of friends that I... We all social circles, those sort of things. I have to admit I did hesitate. I did hesitate. But you know what I found really interesting over the nine months that I've been in this job and I've understood the industry more and I've got to know the exporters and I understand the excellent work they do, I don't hesitate anymore. And actually what I've found is people are actually more interested in it um, than, than I first reasoned. Um, so I, I might not pull out the facts because normally at barbecues and those sort of things, I'm a few sheets to the wind, so I can't remember them all. But I, I think that's actually significant because I do sense even within um, Canberra, which might have that leaning, there's a genuine interest and a genuine shift. Um, so that goes to why we need to communicate our story better too. Yeah. And, and look, you know, I think, Steve, just to add... Um, those animal welfare officers are, are again all about the fact that we care as an industry. I mean, sure, part of it is to help you meet the regulatory environment, but you know, industry was uh, involved deeply in in constructing that environment, and and it is about you know uh, extending our welfare beyond borders be, to the rest of the globe. And that's costly, and I know that it's annoying at times because of the resistance that you meet and the cultural barriers that you face, um, but it's uh, incredibly important. Is there any other questions? Oh, sorry, John. I keep, on, I, I keep on... He's right behind me, so I keep on ignoring him. I just wanted to add that I actually believed the third one should be profitability mm -hmm. because 
we shouldn't see profitability as a dirty word. Mm -hmm. And I think we're actually all too concerned about saying that we want to be profitable nowadays out in the open. And I got asked early on when I was doing the sheep collective stuff, but isn't it all about the money? And I hesitated and I, I've, I thought about that statement for a long time and it is actually all about the money because without profitability, you don't have the money to actually pour back into animal welfare and programs and training. Yeah. So the better that we can actually run our business and have, instead of having silly regulation that doesn't improve animal welfare and just costs us money... Yeah we can be using that money to better our programs and better the animal welfare. So profitability is good animal welfare outcomes. Yeah, thanks, thanks John. And Sam wants yeah, to well, have a little go at this one too. Just to put some cream on that cake. Um, look, the, the Mercado work, um, yeah, it came out of our R&D program. So we've done work on both sheep and cattle. And, you know, I think it's always um, when, you, when you're setting up the terms of reference for these types of research projects and you're really trying to understand you know, where the participants are, where the values and what portion of the of the value is retained at different points. It, it's, a, it's a good reminder, it's a healthy reminder of why we're doing it. And, and you know, you mentioned all of the things that everyone actually cares about, the environment and, 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 and pest management, weed control, all of those things when, work when the system works. And, you know, to, the, the, the surprising work we did in, in the cattle when, you know, it, it can be up to 57% of the value created by the live export industry for cattle is retained by producers. And when I look at that, you think, well, this is, you know, and the ex this, is, this is a producer's industry as much as it's the exporter's industry. Yep. There was a question out here. Sorry. Yeah, Barry Henderson, producer. Just one for Sam. Um, thinking about feedback, when we supply to a feedlot in Australia... We, uh, we supply under a grid. If we supply to an abattoir, it's a very specific grid. If we supply to live export, it's 280 to 380 kilos with an average of 350 and it's got to have a hump. Um, when can we expect to get some market signals, some, some feedback, so we really can uh, improve the quality and, and put some you know, real money and in, in expect better returns? Yeah, look, there's, there's a couple of answers to that, and I'm sure the exporters might want to have a jump in on that. But look, you know, the, the, there is, we've been looking at some of this information, and, and actually Peter Dunnan's been leading a project on um, data in the, in the supply chain and, and looking at how, um, what, what data is collected in the supply chain all the way along, and how could that be uh, fed back to, to better inform decisions and just seeing what's available. So that's something that we've been looking at. But, you know, we're also making sure that trying to understand what's the effort, where does those information lie and, and what would the outcome be and how does that actually happen? Because it can be quite an enormous um, task for someone that's outside of the exporters where the exporters hold that data themselves. And and I, I think there is an opportunity for, for deeper relationships with, uh, with the exporters and those supply chains to keep that information flowing back. We, we did do, um, we've, we've been toying around with this bit of work with, um, you know, we've done feedlot um, competitions in Indonesia, feeder steer competitions, and that's our thinking about trying to connect uh, feedlots back to the producers so they can, you know, start to stimulate in a, in a nice, um, in a sort of competitive way which is of interest to the Indonesians back to the producers as well. So we are, have been making some, um, some inroads on that, but I think the best cut through is with your, with your exporters. But I don't know if John wants to comment. I don't know if I'm going to get myself in too much trouble answering that one. Look, it's, it's one that probably we don't provide enough feedback to producers. Um, I think uh, most companies are working on limited staffing operations and we get so much data but then don't know how to transfer it in. And this is where, I mean, we, we talk to our importers and they don't normally pass back to us what each line of cattle did over the period. We, we get a general uh, sort of feedback. Yeah, the cattle were doing 1.4 kilos a day and uh, the shipment was good, but they don't break it down because on a shipment we, we may have 10 to 30 different vendors, so uh, we probably don't have that complexity of data to feed straight back. It's more general information. 
but okay. I think it's something we need to look at doing. Thanks, thanks, John. Look, I'm sorry, I know that there's more questions out there, but I'm getting the wind-up signal from Mr Eatley. Uh, so, look, uh, we've got to wrap this up, but will you join me uh, in thanking the panel for their contribution? Thank you.